a somewhat spooky subject of the curse of the converted. Um, so I happen to study a sometimes charismatic megafauna, which you may recognize. Um, so I study uh, human population genetics. And this is a recent uh, collection of photos from National Geographic that shows the changing face of America. And you can just see the amount of phenotypic diversity there. It was sort of a hint at the underlying genetic diversity. There's also something cool here. You look at just how much admixed and mixed these, uh, our populations are becoming, and it's something to be aware of. So I'm most interested in this middle part, in population genetics. I care about that sort of variation. But that variation comes from somewhere. So to understand population genetics, you also have to be aware about the underlying molecular biology, and also relevant to what this entire uh, retreat, you have to be aware of evolution. So how do population level processes affect the variation you see in nature? Um, but just knowing this variation is only part of the question, because Population genetics is also relevant towards human health and disease. And what I'm particularly interested in is why do some populations happen to have some diseases and other populations happen to not have them? And so there's a wide variety of forces that can influence population genetic variation. These are just some of them. And so you can see allele frequency, this is low to high. So you're thinking about mutation, you know, the raw supply of variation. Think of genetic drift, okay, it can change allele frequencies. Also, if you have population structure and different allele frequencies in different populations, that can also affect things. Think of natural selection. So what if it's a disease allele? that will be pushed down to a lower frequency. But there's a phenomenon that not everybody's aware about that actually plays a role in this process too, and that's GC bias gene conversion. And this can act in one of two ways. In the blue side, you can actually have it where it pushes down alleles to lower frequency, or it can also act to increase the frequency of some alleles. So, take the hot tub time machine and go back to your uh, you know, early undergrad genetics class, and that's where you may or may not have heard of this phenomena. And so, just to read off here, the one definition of gene conversion is, it's the non-reciprocal exchange of genetic information between homologous sequences. And you can think about this is that sometimes what ends up happening is that your maternal alleles convert your paternal alleles, or vice versa, your paternal alleles could convert your maternal ones. And this actually happens, um, and there's two types of gene conversion. One is allelic, so it's between different copies of the same allele. There's also something called interlocus gene conversion that can occur between members of the same gene family. And where this occurs is in recombination. So it relates a little bit towards uh, Su Jin Yi's talk. Um, and what ends up happening is that when you have a recombination fork, you get this heteroduplex structure. where you can get this pairing between uh, different parents' chromosomes. If there's no SNPs there, there's no problem at all. It doesn't matter. But if there happens to be a SNP there, what ends up happening is you can have mispairing. And your cells don't know which, you know, which, when you have your mispairing, basically it tries to fix that. And this, so DNA repair machinery comes in, comes in, and it repairs. If it was unbiased, there'd be no effect. But what ends up happening is it's biased towards keeping G and C alleles. And there's actually some ideas that this actually may be an evolved response to methylated cytosines. Okay, so you have C to T, so you get a lot of T to G mispairing, and it's basically it seems like there might be some indication that keeping the, the G in that case is advantageous. So what ends up happening is that if you happen to be like an AG heterozygote, you think, oh, 50% chance of passing it on to either kid, to, to a child, but you're actually a little bit more biased to pass on a G. And so throughout this talk, there's two broad questions you want to think about. First, they might seem to be unrelated, but they are. Otherwise, I wouldn't have them on this slide. So the first is, how does gene conversion shape population genetic variation? And the other question is a little bit broader. And it's the idea of, well, how can disease alleles become common in populations? I mean, you think natural selection would push them to be very rare. Um, so just two things to think about. So I happen to study human populations. And one thing I like to work with is, whole genome sequencing. It's starting to become not quite affordable. Well, it's becoming more affordable. And so in this case, um, I looked at five populations. They have a whole range of demographic history. They range from uh, Yoruban agriculturalists in, in Nigeria to three Af African hunter-gatherer populations, pygmy individuals in the rainforest of Cameroon, Sindawi populations, which now are largely agricultural, and the Hadza, who are still largely a hunter-gatherer population. We've also included uh, European individuals, and, so, and one thing to keep in mind with European individuals is they've gone through a population bottleneck, say, 75,000 years ago with the out-of-Africa migration. So for each population, we have five genomes 
um, sequenced at really high coverage, 60x coverage, and one advantage of that coverage is that we have really, really low error rates. So one thing I required was that for each SNP, each polymorphism, it had to be completely sequenced without any problem in all 25 individuals. After this, we had, I think, 10.77 million variants. Okay, so a lot of variants, and one great thing about that is it lets you slice up the genome in lots of cool ways. And so, I was looking at data, and I saw something that looked really puzzling. And just to orient you, this shows the proportion of SNPs that have a particular allele frequency, and this shows derived allele frequency. Once again, a derived allele is something that you can think about where it's a new mutation. It tends to be in our lineage, where an ancestral um, allele is the one that we share with chimps. And, okay, it makes sense. Most alleles tend to be low-frequency derived alleles. But something fishy is going on over here. So the trick was trying to figure out what is going on there. Is this massive positive selection? Is it some really strange demographic scenario? But I was seeing this across every population I looked at. Um, so it hints that it probably isn't something to do with demography. And it turns out that it can be explained at least partially with biased gene conversion. So one, one problem that comes out is that when you're looking at allele to figure out whether it's derived or ancestral, you have to know what the ancestral state is. And as Sujin alluded to, these CPG sites are really, really mutable. And so what ends up happening is it can be really hard to infer ancestral states there. So what I did was I ruled out those CPG sites. Okay, they're important, but for the sake of this, because we don't know what's ancestral, we focus, I ended up focusing on the remaining 7 million SNPs. And so you, oops, so you can see the ancestral allele and the derived allele. You get this 4 by 4 table, and you can say, well, what types of SNPs are there? And they're broadly three different classes. So in here, you have ATCG, and the gray are ones where gene conversion is unbiased. So it's a week to week. It's like an A to a T change. You also have strong to strong, like a C to a G. But then you have these other two classes, and I'm going to keep this color scheme throughout this talk. Blue are ones where gene conversion slows down evolution. So you go from a strong allele, a C or G, to a weak allele, an A or T. And the red is where gene conversion can speed up evolution. It's the opposite. You go from an A or T to a C or G. And so one thing I did was I looked at and saying, well, well, how does this affect genetic distances? So one thing in population genetics is we use statistics that are like FST and also population branch statistics. And the net effect of gene conversion is it does affect these genetic differences, distances. It does it in a pretty subtle way. I mean, they're highly significant because I'm looking at a huge number of variants. But basically, for the sites where it's favored by gene conversion, it accelerates 3%. Where it's unfavored, it decelerates roughly 3%. So it's a slight change in the rate of evolution. But where it really starts to matter is when you look at the allele frequencies of each one of these populations. So if you remember before, there was that bump on the right-hand side, those high-frequency derived alleles. Well, for each one of these five populations, if you look at sites where it's not affected by gene conversion, it's a nice curve. It goes down, it's low down there. If you look at the red class, where it's favored by biased gene conversion, you see this shift to the right, which means that it's basically elevating the frequency of those alleles. If you look at the, also, if you look at the blue class, these are ones where it's slowed down, you see this leftward shift. So what's happening is that the allele frequencies you see are shaped by this molecular phenomenon. And so rather than squint your eyes and try to look at these curves, you can look at statistics of these. And so one thing is, if this is actually due to gene conversion, you should expect to see different effects in different regions of the genome. So what I did was I partitioned the genome into five quintiles, so high recombination all the way down to low recombination and look to see these different popgen statistics. So Tajima's D looks at, um, basically looks at intermediate frequency alleles. And what you see is that you have a lot more inter intermediate frequency alleles for this red class, for this favored class, where basically you see a pattern that crossed all five populations. It's actually interesting here for the Hadza and CEU. You see that they have a different pattern there. And that's because these three populations have pretty much unrestricted population growth where these ones have gone through recent bottlenecks. You can also look at Fei and Wu's H, which, looks at, which tends to be focused a little bit more at low frequency alleles. And you can see a really striking pattern where for you know, SNPs where the derived allele is favored by bias gene conversion, the red class, there's a really strong pattern and also accelerates in high recombination regions of the genome. You can also look at mean allele frequencies and also the skew in the allele frequencies and the patterns come out. So one thing that comes out of this is that the effects towards the positive, the speeding up of evolution, those tend to be stronger at least when you look at allele frequencies, then the opposite effect, the blue. And so we know that this phenomenon exists, but then the question is, well, how strong is it? You know, if you were to you know, basically treat it like a selection coefficient, a mutation rate, you know, is this, is this a strong phenomenon? Like, how much is that shift? And so 
I tried it in a number of different approaches, but the approach that seemed actually cleaner and actually um, in some ways more straightforward is basically say, let's look at the rate of substitution of different types of SNPs. So basically what you want to do is you want to say, okay, these red guys, these ones where it goes from weak to strong, do they have accelerated evolution? And they do, okay? So, so what I did is I compared human to chimp and sequences and looked at other primates too and looked to see what's the probability of fixation of new mutations of that. And what, what you can do is you can compare that to a neutral class, in this, case, in this case the gray class, the ones that aren't affected by gene conversion. And one nice thing about pop gen theory is that gene conversion behaves mathematically like its selection. So you can use the mathematics in natural selection, you can plug it in, you can use the mathematics in neutral theory, plug it in, and you get two equations. And both of these deal with the rates of evolution, mutation rates for each class, and allows you to estimate this parameter NB, and basically that allows you to quantify how strong this is. So what I did is I looked at the rates of evolution of these different types of sites, and I found that the red class was accelerated about 19%. Okay, the rate of fixation was 19% greater than the, the gray class, and then the blue class was actually slowed down about 10%. So that's where these numbers are done here. You can map them to the curves in the previous equations, and then that gives you the scaled strength of selection. And it tends to be pretty weak, okay? So it's on the order of 0.05 to 0.09, which is, if you were to think about it, selection, it's like nearly neutral, okay? It's present, it's shaping these populations, but it's pretty subtle, okay? The other thing was I, I also redid this analysis in different recombination fractions, and in high recombination regions of the genome, it also is stronger. So, don't be scared, it's just a big equation. So, um, so the thing here is that, that the idea that, okay, we've got these shifts in allele frequency. The question is, do they matter? Okay, and one thing you can do is you can make a messy equation that sort of says, okay, given the allele frequencies you see, what's the predicted disease burden? And this takes into account penetrance, the chance that a disease allele is derived or ancestral, allele frequencies, whether there's inbreeding, whether it's dominant or recessive. And you can look all across the genome, you can sum over, over all those sites, and you can get an estimate. But rather than just like have this messy equation just taken on face value, I wanted to test it. So what I did was for each of these five populations, I basically simulated what would happen if you took those allele frequencies we saw and you made that population be all first cousin mating. Okay, so you're getting a lot more homozygotes. And you can say, well, what's the increase in predicted risk? And depending on the population, it went up from 2.3 to 3.8%. So it's a moderate increase. It's because you have more homozygotes. The idea is those homozygous recessives, they're bad. Well, what's really cool is when you look in the clinical data, it actually is right spot on at about that same level. So when you look at first cousin mating, um, that's the increased morbidity in the offspring of first cousin mating. So it's roughly the same thing. So it's not saying that this is the actual disease burden, but it is a pretty good, it's a pretty good proxy of what happens, at least for recessive alleles. So, well, this is a talk about gene conversion. So the question was, how much of these allele frequency shifts due to gene conversion affecting the, the risk of disease? And there's a huge bump. So this is looking at recessive disease burden. And the idea is if it's a site where it's a weak, strong SNP, so it's like an A to G SNP, you actually see a 50 to 45% increase in the chance of being homozygous recessive for it. Okay, so most alleles tend to be rare, but you're increasing the frequency, you're increasing the chance of observing this. So the idea is that if you happen to have one of these red SNPs and it happens to be a disease SNP, it's more likely to be common in populations. This, these effects are reduced a, a decent bit if they happen to be dominant, and they also, it also matters a lot if a disease allele is derived or ancestral. But we don't really know the spectrum of human mutations like that. I mean, some of this alluded to, with, especially with the methylation issue, but the, the idea is that our, recess, our, our derived alleles, the ones that are brand new, are they more likely to disease, or are these ones that we share with chimps? And we don't know what fraction that is. So one thing with this is that I took the existing frequencies that we had, but somebody might, but you might argue, well, natural selection acts on disease, okay? That's pushing your, the allele frequencies lower. So the question is, what happens if you add natural selection to the mix? Well, the nice thing is, um, four years ago, Sylvain Glenn um, derived an equation that takes into account a balance between mutation, pushing mut uh, alleles into a population, selection, getting rid of them, and then also bias gene conversion, either increasing or decreasing their frequency. So you've got all three things going on. You have a nice little equation. What's good is that we were able to parameterize this value, okay, the strength of gene conversion. We also know mutation rates for each of these classes. So you plug them in, and you have these curves here. 
And the, the takeaway home, the takeaway lesson here is that the effects of bias gene conversion are a lot stronger when selection is weak. If selection is strong, it just, it just, when selection is strong, it just dominates the system. And so just to recap, um, the idea is that allele frequencies and genetic distances, they're modified by GC bias gene conversion, or GBGC. Um, also, it tends to be a relatively weak, nearly neutral force, but this force is persistent, and it's persistent over evolutionary time. And because that persistence, it can shape allele frequencies. And the thing to keep in mind here is that even though, it, and, and, and because of that persistence, because it's changing allele frequencies, it can actually impact the risk of actually having a hereditary disease. So I'd also like to touch very, very briefly on some other projects I'm going to be working on over the next couple months. So one is to look at patterns of sex bias demography. Okay, so this is the idea where as humans left Africa, we see the X diversity really drops off really fast. And one thing this is consistent with is a male bias colonization. So basically the idea is as humans expanded, you might have 50 males and 20 women at that leading edge. So what I'm trying to do is to basically take genomic data and to figure out what sort of demographic drug graphic scenarios are most consistent with that. Another project in collaboration with David Reich and Sarah Tishkoff is looking at 50 pairs of genomes, so 50 African populations, two genomes per population. It's an amazing survey of African genetic variation, but taking a gene's eye view of the out of Africa migration. So the idea is what percentage of genetic variation managed to make it out 75, 60,000 years ago? And the idea also is that, is that biased? Does it tend to be in certain sorts of genes? Does it tend to be in non-coding regions? We don't know yet. Lastly, I'm in collaboration with Tim Rubick, and the idea is to look at the evolutionary genetics of prostate cancer risk. So one thing we know is that men of African descent have elevated risk of prostate cancer. So what I'm doing is looking at known GWAS hits and basically seeing, well, do any of these happen to have any interesting pop gen patterns between Africa and Europe? And then also, are there any signals of selection to maybe explain why the risk might differ between different continents? And so with that, I'd like to thank the individuals who graciously donated the DNA, Sarah, Matt, and everybody else in the Tishkoff lab, and a number of people who gave helpful comments throughout this project. And also in January of next year, my lab will be opening its doors. So thank you very much.